talked about the issue of recovery housing and we sure learned a lot. So I'm the public information coordinator for the Ohio Valley Regional Development Commission. And today is, like I said, day two, and it's just a conversation. It's really not a formal, um, you know, stilted thing. We want everyone to feel comfortable. We want you to put your questions in the chat box and we will try very hard to get those questions out because we're here to learn from each other. And we're here to learn from some really great speakers that we have lined up for day two. So I guess uh, what we wanna focus on, the questions are how do we move action forward around the recovery housing issue? Um, today, we're hoping that we'll be able to answer the questions, what have I learned and what can I do? So we have a really great diverse cross-section of people who signed up for um, the summit to learn about the issue. And that's why we're here today. So uh, day one was a great groundwork with our speakers, Erica Walker, who's with us again today for the Q&A panel that comes at the end of today. She really set us up with an overview of what is recovery housing and talked about the different levels. So I think level one and two is a big focus for us. As we talk, we'll learn more about that. And uh, we also want to make sure that we have time at the end for questions. So uh, we're going to definitely build that into today. So the takeaways from February 25th were uh, laying the groundwork for the concept and also talking with Jay Hash about uh, the, the practical applications of recovery housing as it relates to treatment. We also have a great group that the whole reason we're having the summit is um, because of the Recovery to Work Learning Academy Cohort Partnership, which is a mouthful, but it's been a, a long project and uh, we're gonna learn more about that. So those are the people that have really laid the groundwork for today. Um, definitely wanna encourage your Q&A and I have a privilege right now to introduce a really great person. Uh, John Hemmings is with us today. He's a, our executive director here at the Ohio Valley Regional Development Commission. Um, John has been the executive director from August 2008 to present, and we're located in Waverly, Ohio. OVRDC is a public regional planning commission that coordinates federal, state, and local economic and community development resources to encourage development in the 12 Southern Ohio counties that we serve, Adams County, Brown, Claremont, Fayette, Gallia, Highland County, Jackson, Lawrence, Pike, Ross County, Scioto, and Venton. OVRDC serves as a local development district for the Appalachia Regional Commission, as an economic development district for the U.S. Department of Commerce, Economic Development Administration, and as a regional transportation planning organization, RTPO, for the Ohio Department of Transportation. So in these capacities, OVRDC prioritizes development needs and sets priorities for projects to be funded by ARC and EDA. We develop a public participation and transportation plan for the region. So OVRDC was established in 1967 and has a 53 year history of fostering economic development and job creation in the region. So would you please welcome for our first speaker of the day, a great guy and my boss, John Hemmings. Good morning, John. Good morning. Thank you, Gina. Um, good morning to everyone and appreciate everybody's participation today. I'll be brief uh, so you guys can get on to the real meat and potatoes of the day. And uh, just to say thanks for uh, uh, participation, first of all. And I want to thank uh, Gina and Kim here of our staff for putting this together. Julie Bolin at uh, Ross County and um, others that have been instrumental in putting this together. Ken Poole with uh, Crack. Uh, so uh, we appreciate the uh, opportunity to be, to be part of this. And uh, thought we'd give you just a real quick uh, rundown of what our goals are at OVRDC with, uh, with the uh, substance uh, use disorder um, issue in our region. First of all, we are a local development district for the Appalachian Regional Commission. And uh, so you heard from John Kerry at the last one. Uh, we work closely with his office, the governor's office of Appalachia, and we work with the ARC. I see Karen Fabiano on the, on the call. And Karen, I've known Karen for 
many years, 20 plus. And uh, so uh, we work with these folks to basically, we identify the priority projects in our region for Appalachian Regional uh, Commission assistance. Now, not all of their programs do we do that for, but the base program, we've done that for 50 years. And basically we, we kind of, so I always say we separate the cream from the milk. We, you know, we're uh, looking for what's going to rise to the top and look the best and uh, make the most sense to fund. So that's our, kind of our role working with 12 counties, as Gina said, in our region. And uh, one of the things I think uh, when the, when ARC came up with the uh, cohort initiative, and that was actually through D uh, Development District Association of Appalachia, um, they, ARC had given the Development District Association of Appalachia a grant to identify four cohort groups throughout the 13 states of Appalachia. We put in for it, and I remember telling uh, Gina and Kim here, I said, it's not like we have a shortage of work. I said, but our area is kind of ground zero for this. And I said, this gives us an, a, an ability here to maybe not get involved in it so much from the standpoint of trying to um, be another player in the game, but more or less maybe bring resources together to be a regional group that can pro provide some cohesiveness and uh, get people working together more, um, sh help help with sharing of ideas, things such as that. And uh, so, um, and part of the reason for doing it, as I said, we were very busy at the time. Um, I said, uh, our area seems to kind of be ground zero for this uh, situation. And I said, I think we look foolish if we don't try to address it. If we just sit idly by and act like it's uh, that white elephant in the room that we don't want to pay attention to. So, um, and, and I say that because I can, I told Gina this yesterday, um, and I think I've told her it before, that it was probably 10 years ago, we were in Washington at the Appalachian Regional Commission, myself and a couple of our uh, partners here in Ohio. And I brought this up, the uh, substance use disorder. And I, I told him, I said, this isn't a drug issue. I said, this is a workforce issue. And um, I was trying to convey that message 10 years ago um, to ARC. And they've taken an interest in this. And um, you know, the one thing I got to say about ARC is they don't have a very, very big budget in the scheme of things when you look at the federal government, but they've looked at this issue and said, let's see what we can, you know, how we can address it. Um, and uh, with what resources they have, they're trying. And I appreciate that from the ARC's perspective. Um, but again, we put the cohort together and uh, really that was to, for us to be part of something that, like, as I said earlier, how can we be a convener of the experts. How can we bring people in that uh, you know have great ideas in one one county or region of our uh, we have 12 counties. How can we get that shared into other areas? How can we be that convener? And um, so one of the things that we started with was we have uh, put in for an inspire grant through the ARC. Um, we have tentatively been approved for that. Uh, we've been asked a couple questions for clarification on our application. And um, we just submitted those yesterday. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, we'll finally, uh, we'll have addressed all the, any outst outstanding issues on that. And the, again, that's to start something in three of our counties that we hope that can be duplicated. And really we're just overseeing the project. The real experts are organizations like Frost County Community Action, um, Jackson Vinton Community Action. Those are the folks that work with the clientele and, and also the businesses um, that we hope to incorporate into this plan. So, so again, our role in this is it, it's there. It's a workforce issue in our region. It is not in our um, portfolio to be experts in this. And we're not trying to be, and we're not going to try to become that. But we do want to be a change agent, uh, somebody that can bring people together, as I said. So that's that's what I see our role is uh, regionally um, for this. And um, again, it has economic impact on our region. And that's, that's important that we address things like that. So I think the goals for today 
um, or learn and examine sustainable models for recovery housing. And as you all are well aware, well aware of, housing is an issue as part of recovery to work. And uh, these are that. And again, that's where I say I'm not the expert on this, but there's a lot of stuff we've learned, and that's one of them. And uh, without going into the details, it's just one of those issues. Also, how can we inform local stakeholders of funding opportunities available? And I think that's the real thing where we come in is how can we help our local organizations and communities understand what's going on, where the funding is, and who's doing what, and what can be duplicated in other areas. And then identify partners that are needed uh, because some of you may need to work together to make some of this happen. You may not have the technical expertise in your organization to make something you really wanna do, so instead of trying to hire that person, is there a way to org, uh, work together? So I think that's the conduit we bring. And I think this is one of our first efforts to do that. So Gina, I will turn it back over to you. I appreciate everybody's uh, participation. And uh, I'm gonna try to listen in here this, uh, this morning. I'm sorry I did not get to join you the first time. Uh, it sounded like it was a really successful uh, uh, Zoom meeting. So, uh, Loved a bit to have been together, but this is the time we live in. So uh, <clears throat> smile a lot, and somebody might be watching. You don't you don't know about it. So um, <laughs> thanks thanks again for participation. And Jean, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, John. Today we have two main sessions, and then we're going to do a Q and A at the end. So our first session: What are the models for sustaining the recovery housing and benefits for it to the local workforce? And then our second session with uh, Danielle Gray is current state of recovery housing in Ohio. And then we have our Q&A. So we're gonna do a Q&A after our very first featured speaker. So we're gonna welcome now Ernie Fletcher and Lori Baer from Fletcher Group. And I'll, while they take over the screen with their slides and everything, I'll just introduce you to Ernie. Ernie is a fighter pilot board certified physician, statesman and healthcare visionary. Ernie Fletcher was elected in 1998 to the first of three consecutive terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. In 2003, he was elected the 60th governor of Kentucky. As founder of the Fletcher Group, Ernie continues a legacy of innovative public service that promises to extend the company's unique model of recovery ecosystems, recovery ecosystems to states across the country. And also with, with Ernie, we have Lori Baer. Lori is 25 years a registered nurse, and that's given Lori a keen understanding of healthcare's diverse population base. In the five years before joining the Fletcher Group, Lori devoted herself to creating second chance career opportunities for the most vulnerable by developing and teaching Accelerating Opportunity Kentucky general educational development programs at Ashland Community and Technical College in Kentucky. Her ability to reduce barriers and bridge gaps in education plays a key role in the Fletcher's group, Fletcher Group's promotion of recovery through the kind of meaningful employment that rebuilds lives, restores families, and revitalizes local communities. Good morning, Ernie and Lori. Thanks so much for being with us. Gina, thank you very much. We really appreciate this opportunity. And John, we thank you uh, all for what you and your organization have done on this and really appreciate the opportunity to collaborate. Um, let me start with who we are. Uh, Fletcher Group, uh, uh, we founded that, my wife and I did, out of the work we'd done as governor on uh, establishing Recovery Kentucky. We work with, uh, one of our first grants was ARC, and we had met with the director of ARC several years ago and John, you're right, your work with them had really gotten them interested and they started to look and understand how SUD affects the economy within Appalachia and understood if they don't start addressing some of those underlying issues, it was gonna be very difficult to have an impact on the economic issues. So um, they have, uh, we were awarded a, a power grant with them called ROAR, Recovery, Hope, Opportunity, and Resiliency to help increase the establishment of recovery housing in several targeted counties that were impacted by coal. And not only that, but to look at developing recovery capital for those individuals through 
getting them into meaningful employment. And we'll be talking about that as part of the sustainability of, of uh, what you can do in recovery housing. Uh, we also have a HRSA grant. We're a rural center of excellence for recovery housing across the US. We respond to any request for technical assistance in a HRSA designated rural county. We have uh, about 26 folks across the country that specialize in different areas. So if somebody requests TA, we were able to bring someone with a specialty in that area. <clears throat> Uh, Recovery Kentucky, I, I won't go over that, but the, it's been a successful model and we invite anyone to come down and visit some of the centers. We have some well-established outcomes. Uh, we've provided about 1,400 technical assistance across the country in the last couple of years. Um, it's all around recovery housing and we also have a research department. We are working to build the science behind recovery housing. And not only that, but we like to see an increased emphasis on the long-term approach, which I think we're beginning to see uh, toward recovery uh, rather than just treating uh, harm reduction, some things which are necessary, but looking at long-term. And we really appreciate Ohio and the work you all have done. You're probably one of the leaders as far as states in recovery support services and particularly recovery housing. The recovery ecosystem and the important part of this for sustainability really is to understand how recovery housing fits in the full continuum of care. And it's a very important part. It's not necessary that everyone with SUD uh, be involved or, or participate in some sort of peer support system that's within recovery housing, but it's an essential part of the continuum of care and a, a large number of individuals especially that have been affected by the criminal justice system, often need that recovery housing for transition. And those who have seen a lot of their lives upset or, or, or destroyed uh, need that kind of intense and long-term uh, support. As you can see though, we believe employment is a very important part of uh, building that recovery capital. Um, recovery ecosystem, it's important. And as you look at these different parts of the community or different uh, entities within the community, for sustainability, I think it's very important that as you begin to look at developing projects that you engage a, a lot of these members, if not all within the community. They can help with ensuring that you reduce the envy issues. They can also help with funding and bring the community together. And it really is a part of that continuum of care to build that recovery ecosystem. And John, this came out of ARC, really that started a lot of this conversation uh, about this concept of recovery ecosystem. I wanna turn it over to Lori, who's done a tremendous job for us over the last several years, especially with our ARC project and transitioning folks uh, from recovery into meaningful employment. Thank you, Ernie. Um, so, you know, as we all know, one of the key um, ingredients to recovery is that meaningful employment piece. Um, you know, our goal is to um, help these individuals become self-sufficient um, once they leave the safety net of the recovery center. But, um, you know, we still have to have those social supports in place in order for them uh, to be successful. Um, I just wanted to share with you um, just, just some outcomes that we have noticed in the Recovery Kentucky um, system and some of the reporting that we do. Um, if you look there, there were 54% of those clients coming into the, to the Recovery Center who were had been employed in the past six months. After they completed um, the uh, recovery program, um, when we followed up with those individuals, 80% of them have maintained employment. <clears throat> So how do we get people from the beginning of recovery um, into meaningful employment? And it's, it's really um, a very um, long, it's not a long road, but it's a road that requires a lot of people traveling along that road with you, I think would be the best way to explain it. Um, you definitely need the recovery housing support. Um, the workforce training is absolutely essential. And then you also need um, that employment piece while you're still providing all of those recovery support services. 
Um, like Ernie said, I have been working on the, um, the ARC Power Grant for the past couple of years, and this is just a snapshot as, of truly just a handful of some of the partners that we work with on a daily basis um, to obtain meaningful employment for our individuals. So it's very much a community partnership, a state partnership, and even a national partnership sometimes for some of these clients to um, get them to where they need to be um, when they leave the program. So where do you start um, if you're looking at meaningful employment? Um, and I think the most important uh, part initially is knowing what your needs are. Um, sometimes I think, in, you know, we're, we're all a little bit guilty of just saying, okay, we're gonna offer one, two, and three. Um, but really in order to, to offer that meaningful employment, you have to know not only what the needs are of that client, but you also need, need to know what the needs are of the communities that you're working within. Um, so when we first started our ARC grant, um, we were working with six of the Recovery Kentucky centers. And so we thought the best way to do this was just to create a work group at each of those centers. And I literally just sent out invitations to anyone and everyone who might be involved in that community that would want to attend. Um, I, I reached out to businesses. I reached out to educational opportunities, to just regular community members. Um, you know, other support services within the community and just anyone who wanted to attend, um, you show up here at this date time and we're going to talk about how we can help these people move forward um, as together. Um, and I was really, really kind of overwhelmed with the response. You know, it's almost like everyone kind of sighed and was like, shoo, finally, somebody's going to bring this all together. You know, we're going to all get together and be able to talk about these things. So I think, you know, everyone has that desire. I don't think it's an intentional silo that we put ourselves in. It's just we don't know how to engage others to the best of the ability. Um, so, you know, we invited everyone to end up establishing these work groups at each of the centers and had a lot of participation. Um, and then we continued those meetings on a regular basis, even once we were able to get our wheels turning and kind of get some things in motion, maintaining those relationships is extremely, extremely important. Um, we also do some assessment very early on so as soon as those clients are um, out of that initial um, 30 to 60 days, um, we and, and not all clients are going to need that. This is just for people who are coming into a long term recovery program. Even if you had um, just an out outpatient recovery program, you know, you could determine at what point are those clients ready to start looking at some of these things that, that will predict what their skill sets are and and what their interests are. Um, you know, so the earlier you can do that, the better you can plan. Um, that way you don't fall into that cookie cutter mindset. You know, if you know two or three months ahead of time that this client really wants a unique type of training, that there's something they're really passionate about, you want to be able to offer that to them when they're ready. So we have them complete an education and employment survey that I just created. Um, it's, it's nothing fancy. It's just a document that tells us, you know, what, what are your likes and dislikes? What are some of the barriers that you may have that we can help you overcome? Uh, when you get to the point that you're able to do some training and start looking at employment. So being proactive goes a long way. Um, and like I said, it doesn't have to be um, a big packet of work. It could simply be a sheet of paper with a few questions to help you get started. Um, after they complete that survey, then we review those and that way we can start planning um, for these clients as to what their needs are gonna be. The opportunities truly are endless for this population. Um, the skill sets that the recovery community possess are absolutely mind blowing. If, if you really get down to it and meet with these individuals one on one, um, it's, it's we have so much untapped talent um, in this population. And I think, you know, our the goal of our work is to tap into that talent and plug it in where we identify the needs within the community. Um, some of the, the programs that we have developed um, with our ARC Power Grant, of course, GED and employment readiness is absolutely essential in the beginning. Um, if they don't have their GED, they immediately start working on that. We, we collaborate with our local skills U. They do all of their employment readiness, all of those skills, those soft skills that we know that they're gonna need. Um, we, we start those very early on. Um, we've been able to connect with the training center for online peer support certification. You know, COVID really threw a wrench in a lot of all of our plans um, on how we were going to move forward with some of these activities, but you just adjust your sales and find an alternate route 
Um, so we were able to find um, an online peer support certification training that has been extremely popular um, among our clients in the recovery centers. But, you know, it isn't just enough to provide them that training. We also want to link them to that employment. So, you know, in a three month time frame, we had 18 individuals complete this peer support certification and 14 of those were hired. And the other four were just waiting to finish their phase two uh, um, to gain employment. So, you know, the need is out there. We identified that the need is out there and then we found a way to bring that to them even during COVID. Um, not everyone is going to want to um, do some sort of a certification course. So you have to think outside the box for those individuals. What, you know, that, and that's why that employment survey is so important because you know, if they're not interested in obtaining um, some online training or, or a school, uh, go to a community college or something, what can we offer them? Um, so we developed um, um, a partnership with Southeast uh, Kentucky Economic Development to do some cohorts of students from each center <clears throat> Um, we actually put them through a SMARTS and a BBOSS training, which is an entrepreneurial type training. So we allowed each center to um, develop their own business idea. Just hypothetically, if you could develop a business for your center, what would you do? And we left it totally in their hands. Um, so each center um, completed that four weeks of training with um, Amanda Kelly from SCED. And they did that all virtually online. They would meet certain times of the week developed an entire business plan. And then at the end of that training, we held like a Shark Tank top competition for them to present their ideas. Um, we invited um, ARC to participate and be a judge on that project. And they were so impressed with what the clients has done that, you know, that they had done with their projects that we were able to actually fund those. So now our centers are actually going to be running these businesses um, out of their center. So, you know, and I think when you look at a training like this, although we know that's not a career for these clients. They're not always gonna stay at these centers, but the skills that they gained from, from developing that business and working in that business are so transferable. Um, when they transition out of the center, they may go on to open their own business out in the community, which is what we love. Um, we have teamed up with the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation to create some second chance equine programs. Um, we have one recovery center that will be having an onsite farm um, so not only will they get the equine therapy um, just naturally from working with the horses, they're going to obtain a very valid um, horsemanship training that will lead them into employment in the equine industry. Um, we have reached out to some of our uh, thoroughbred and equine partners throughout the state. For, uh, for I don't know if we lost Lori. I may have to pick up from here. I, I won't be quite as uh, uh, informative as she is, but uh, let me just um, go through this a little bit. She developed a third bed retirement foundation, second chance program, and a kind of an elite groomsman program. We worked at uh, first Kentucky's known as uh, kind of the horse capital of the world. So uh, one of the farmers or uh, Horse individuals, uh, actually tailor-made farms, was able to set up a program, and they've already started where they bring people out of recovery to work with horses. And there's a lot of opportunities for horses set up to be trainers. And um, not only that, but that therapeutic relationship with uh, a horse has been proven. Uh, there's a, a lot of other opportunities there. The bottom line is be creative in this and look at the opportunities that within Ohio and within your community. What does it have to do with sustainability? The more you're engaged with the business of the community, the more they realize the importance of recovery housing. And some of these folks that, let me say this, there's been some real evidence that individuals that come out of recovery with the experience that they have are actually better employers, or employees, more reliable, and have a lot of uh, a life lived experience that uh, brings a, a great deal of maturity. So that is a way of engaging and helps with uh, acceptance in the community. And not only that, but sustainability and support within the community. Again, strong yeah. partnerships. And uh, Lori, speak up if you come back on. Yeah, I'm back. I apologize. Okay. I don't know Eastern Kentucky internet today. <laughs> I apologize, guys. You all know the struggles. I didn't see um, the picture up there, so I'm going to turn it back to you. You did a great job. Um, 
so, you know, we talk about all of these programs, but, you know, logistically speaking, we know these things cost money and we know these things take time. So how do we make these things happen? Because we know even with our grant funding, we do not have enough, um, you know, we can't just pay for everyone to do every program and we have to be creative. And that is where it is so important to do exactly um, what John said in partnering with everyone else within your communities across your state, know who your grant holders are, um, speak with them regularly. Um, you know, we have developed some really great partnerships with others and been able to take pieces of what we do with pieces of what they do and mesh all of that together um, to make sure that everyone has an opportunity. Um, you know, to succeed and, and to complete whatever type of training that they need. Um, so absolutely know who your grant holders are um, and, and reach out to them and say, hey, we can provide this. Would you be able to provide this aspect? And most, I don't know that we've ever been turned down. Um, ongoing communication with our state chamber of commerce. That's extremely important. You know, what we want to know is where do you need help? Where can we fill a need? Um, Kentucky has um, the talent pipeline. Um, so different sectors have their own talent pipeline. So I'll communicate with them on a very, very regular ongoing basis to identify what needs are out there and how can we fill those, those needs with the individuals that we're, we're caring for. Um, our local career centers are like our family. And that is the absolute, you know, that is 100% the truth. I talk to them and some days I might talk to them a little more than some of my family, um, but really build out those relationships from your recovery center with your local career center. They have some great training opportunities. Um, they can help you um, if, reach employers. Um, you know, just so many things that they can provide. Um, one thing they can do, you know, they, I'm sure it's the same in Ohio, um, but that we owe a funding that can cover some of the cost of education. And um, they can also help fund some on the job training. Um, you know, that's appealing to employers. So, you know, if you talk to an employer and they're a little bit nervous about hiring an individual, set up like a, a mini internship or, you know, a, a 90 days of, okay, let's work with a career center. Let's see if we can get some WEO funding to cover some of these hours um, and, and let them work for you for three months. And let's see how that goes. And you provide that social support to that individual to make sure that it's as successful as it can be. Um, to where they can see that, you know what, we this is where we need to be um, reaching out um, to fill the needs for our company. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there with your career centers. Um, utilize your navigators from your local community colleges. Most times they are very eager to come out and, and talk to your um, clients. Um, they can also help with things like um, the Work Ready Scholarships, Accelerated Opportunity Funding. There's a lot of programs where individuals, and I'm sure Ohio has the same, um, where they can work concurrently on their GED and take some college courses or some short-term certifications through the workforce department. Um, so, you know, those are all just, just some opportunities for you to uh, make those connections within the community um, to help you. Um, I, you know, I would never recommend you try to do it all on your own. That's all of us are passionate about the work and working together just makes us stronger and we can do more for the population that we serve. Your local workforce boards, your business associations, those are all just, you know, we could go on and on and on about where you could um, reach out to build those partnerships. But those are some of the key ones I think that you have to have in place when you're looking at employment and education for your clients. Um, and then also building relationships in the business world. Um, we rely on the chamber to point us in that direction, but ultimately we want to get out and come face to face with these employers and explain the efforts um, of, of what we're doing and the skills and abilities of the population that we're serving. Um, you know, we've been able to establish the MOUs with App Harvest, with Triple G Construction, Secretary Smithfield Foods. You know, we just really get out and advocate for these clients in these businesses and um, you know, I think Kentucky um, is a leader in that aspect. Um, our Chamber of Commerce also has a really strong fair chance employment um, component that they work on. So just letting employers know that, hey, we have a lot of untapped talent here that could really help your company be successful and explain how you will help guide that relationship with that client. And, um, you know, you will have a lot of success if you do that. <clears throat> I'll turn it back over to Ernie and let him talk a little more about how the money works, which is always good. Thanks, Lori. You know, when you look at sustainability, it is a 
it'll primarily, a lot of it's about financing. And I, I do think when you look at uh, financing, again, the reason we started off with relationships and building that recovery ecosystem is that gives you a lot of stream sources of financing, of financial support, and a lot of folks that are advocates for what you're doing. Um, so that's why we talked about it's important to develop a, a community work group. Um, one of the things that we find in recovery, the biggest ROI that we've seen uh, outside of the human capital ROI, and that's restoring and trans transforming lives, is that criminal justice system cost. It's, a, it's extremely expensive. We spend billions of dollars this, uh, every year in this country on incarcerating individuals and 60% have SUD. So develop a relationship, it might seem counterintuitive, but develop a relationship with uh, your county executive, your jails, your court systems. Um, also look at economic development. Uh, again, we talked about employment because that is part of economic development. A lot of communities have trouble finding uh, skilled individuals uh, and it's also an important part of being able to recruit empl employers into a community is being able to have some skilled employers available. So that's very important. Uh, Jeannie, you mentioned level one and two are primarily the focus. I, I, we really un understand that. We have a team that works with level one and two. Oxford House is primarily level one, and we encourage folks to connect with Oxford House for level one. And um, I think you all had a talk on the different types in our level, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, but I, I, I want you, even as a small community, we've got some large facilities in small rural communities. One's on the top of a reclaimed mine in Knott County, Kentucky, and it's a very, fairly, very rural area. And so don't fail to dream large dreams while you're setting up level one and two, level two, because there are some folks that need this intensity and we've got a good program and outcomes. And there's several around the country. I know Hazleton Betty Ford has a, a great success. There's other programs, the Recovery Kentucky, we have outcomes over nine years. So we'll talk a little bit about funding on that level and the different levels. Um, you know, some of the, the build, one thing that if you can reduce the cost and we're working toward getting Medicaid payment and I know there's other sources we'll talk about, but in order to get uh, Medicaid to start paying and we're working with CMS, you've got to have a, a, a model that shows outcomes that are positive. You've got to have also show that it's a good investment for them and that they're getting some return on their money. Um, by being able to build a facility without having to amortize the capital cost, you reduce your operational cost. And right now, and some of the facilities that we work with and have helped develop is the operational cost. Individuals can have six to nine months of supportive peer support, and I'll say treatment within that recovery center for what it costs for 30 days intense clinical care. And the outcomes are better because you, you maintain that recovery capital and build it even to meaningful employment. I will say this and, and, and it's start, if you look at the curve of overdose deaths as of May 2020, year, year ending that from the CDC, the increase in overdose deaths went up well before COVID. COVID has, has, mag has amplified that and worsened it. But what we were doing is not bending the curve. It's making a difference and we support all the harm reduction, all those programs. But to get some real decrease in overdose deaths, you've got to have that longer term approach, which includes recovery housing. And we believe that's a good investment for payers and Medicaid. If we can keep our operational costs down, that's gonna make us much more sustainable and much more likely for Medicaid to be able to pay for it. I won't go through the details on some of this funding. We have some folks and experts that can get with you if, you, if you're interested and go through the details because it varies from location to location. Each state is different. Uh, their low-income uh, low housing tax credits and some of their home funds, home funds, et cetera. Um, here's just uh, describing LIHTC, but it is, uh, it's a fund set up by HUD that allows tax credits that are purchased um, through entities, a lot of times banks, other entities that buy those 
and it reduces their tax burden. At the same time, they're able to fund the capital construction. Uh, it, we can talk in specifically about the things that are required for you to do that. It's a complicated process. It's not for everyone, but if you're gonna build a large facility, I encourage you to, to consider them. Um, gap funding, uh, and the reason we say that is there's uh, oftentimes for new market tax credits, for example, they require that you have some additional funding in that, and this we call gap funding. If you're not able to get the light tech or new market uh, or some of the other things, there's a lot of different programs there. It's, it's complicated. Uh, one thing that uh, we recognize working with is, uh, you know, sort of a, a community development finance institution, a CDFI is, is important, or particularly finding a developer that's very familiar with LIHTC. And we have done that in the recent project that we've done. And we've taken a developer that's very, very uh, experienced at that. And they know all the pathways and all the challenges with some of these uh, different funding mechanisms. Uh, Ohio, again, very progressive. Results Ohio with uh, what we would call social impact bonds. It's really more pay for success. Is, a, is another way and they have, uh, I, I would encourage you to look and just uh, to see, we're glad to help you with that. There's, uh, you've got to be able to show a good ROI and uh, you know present before the General Assembly with that uh, plan and, and that data to show how uh, you're able to use the money that they appropriate uh, to give uh, the state of Ohio a, a good return on their investment. Again, one of the best ways is, is looking at the criminal justice system and reducing recidivism. Our recovery Kentucky rearrest rates are under 10%. Uh, that compares to upwards of 50 to 75% um, of recidivism in folks that do not have those recovery supports and through recovery housing. New market tax credits have been used for recovery program. Um, it's, uh, it requires some other funding additionally, but it can be one of the one of the pieces. Uh, so EB-5 has to do with, it, it's sort of the complicated uh, with folks and foreign investments in um, recovery housing and other, other projects uh, in the country. It's complicated, but we, you know, we can help negotiate. The point is there's a lot of different sources of funding and, and just really develop those relationships in the community uh, look at organizations that can help you look at the different streams. Um, you, you need to look at the site. Uh, it's important. It, it's interesting that the funding that's available can differ substantially depending on your site location. Um, you know, there's an old saying that uh, here, measure twice and cut once. Well, it works in here as well. You know, do your planning, do your upfront planning. And a part of that is site selection. And de developing that local support and that, that local work group, if you will, makes a tremendous difference. Uh, Opportunity Zone, for example, opens you up to some other funding that you don't have that if you're not in one of those, uh, those zones. Now, operationally, if you can reduce, again, your capital cost, you reduce your operational cost substantially for st sustainability. And, um, you know, we can operate a facility and, and house individuals, particularly from corrections, about half the price that it would cost to put them in, in a correctional facility or a jail. Uh, we're working now with a community uh, in a rural community where the drug court judge, we encourage you to develop relationships with uh, those court judges that uh, will see a lot of folks coming through with SUD and begin to uh, when you develop that relationship, you can have those individuals work with them to divert those individuals. You save the jailer, local jailers money who are, who are expending a lot on this. And you also uh, turn a, a life around, reduce the recidivism. So you not only save them on the front end, but you save the court system and the criminal justice system on the back end. We operate some of these large, about a, a million a year, you can operate up to 1.3. Also look at, uh, even if you're in a smaller facility, look at trying to help uh, your residents get food stamps if, if they can qualify. And a lot of them that may have service jobs are, don't have the incomes uh, to be able to uh, you know, support themselves and they qualify for food stamps. 
We also, we use uh, project-based Section 8 in our larger facilities, but in the small facilities, see if those individuals don't qualify for the regular Section 8. Sometimes there's a waiting list. It varies from location to location. And sometimes it's, uh, it's surprising when you are looking at where you're going to develop some recovery housing, talk with your local housing authority and see what's available uh, there within. And that may be another source of income. And these are, these are re recurring flows uh, of funding. So they help you operationally year after year, which uh, it leads to better sustainability. And developing that relationship with the community. Here we have the, we, we give our facilities a target of raising 100,000 a year from the local facility. And that may seem like a lot. Not all of them do that. Uh, some of them are better at fundraising than others. But once you engage the community and they see the benefit of this, they're more inclined to open their pockets. And I will say this in every community, there are folks that can afford to, to write checks and all you have to do is to show them the story and get some people that have had their lives transformed in front of those individuals and they'll open their wallets up and help. We're doing that a project again uh, of raising some money and we set quite a large goal for that. Hospitals raise millions of dollars in local community and uh, recovery housing uh, operations facilities really change lives. Um, over the NAR low, NAR levels, USDA has some low interest loans. And oftentimes those loans even uh, may be forgiven down the line. Um, you can look at uh, homes that, that need rehabilitation. Again, what you're trying to do is reduce your capital cost on the front end by getting some support. And that lowers your amortization, which lowers your operational cost, which helps for sustainability. Um, there's uh, access with, uh, you may, you know, use some other facilities to help people get resources. For example, telehealth, that's more on the support side, but that helps you sustain the support services that you're offering within a community, particularly in a rural area. Uh, other sources, there's veteran vouchers, regular Section 8 I mentioned, Medicaid outpatient coverage. In our lower model, we have a combination of recovery housing with, in a community a behavioral health service organization uh, that operates both the outpatient um, MAT facility, intensive outpatient. They may even have a clinical inpatient along with the recovery house. And the income they get from that medical outpatient coverage can help cover some of the recovery housing. So have a larger organization there that you're working with can help bring in uh, some funding. Some states are working through 1115 waivers. We're working on some of those to be able to pay for recovery housing through Medicaid. We believe it's a, a good use of Medicaid money and it really gets a better return uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, pay for success, we talk about results Ohio, SOAR grants, the new uh, money coming out talks about recovery housing and recovery support services. So keep your eye out on the new SOAR grants that are coming out in the latest legislation. Uh, recovery Ohio, we talked about. The, the last thing I wanted, a few things, are U.S. appropriation earmarks. This is a new bill coming out April 15th. Members of Congress have to have their projects presented for appropriations. This is new, so you probably haven't heard about it. It just really came out in the last couple of weeks. But if you have a relationship with your uh, U.S. congressman or senator, uh, if you don't, I would, I would develop that relationship and you know, work through their staff. Their staff are good and helpful. You may not be able to get to the member themselves, but if you work through the staff and you've got a good project, and you can present that to them. They do have the capability of earmarking a number of projects now, which is a, a, a new, we're going back to earmarks, but they're fairly restricted. So I would encourage you to talk to them and say, hey, I heard about this, what's available out there? Um, outcomes, measure outcomes. If you're gonna keep funding, you've gotta be able to tell people you're effective. And so uh, you've gotta, that'll help win the trust of stakeholders. It's it's winning tax credits, other government assistance, Medicaid and commercial payers, they're all gonna know, do your services work? Do you change lives? Do you turn around lives? Um, I wanna uh, stop with that, and leave some time for some questions, Gina. So uh, we'll open it up for questions now. 
Thank you, Ernie and Lori. Great. That really triggers a lot, I think, for people. Drop your questions in the chat box, and I have a few that were submitted to me directly. Um, one's kind of a follow-up when you were talking about the Medicaid payments. And Ernie and Lori, you know a lot of the people in the audience today, we are not necessarily as up on some of the logistics of recovery housing. So we're going to, in this question, they're asking about level three, level four. So maybe include that in your answer. But the question is, from your experience, Medicaid payments can help with underwriting some of the operating costs. Is this largely for the more intensive level three and level four housing only, or can it be used to help with less intensive level one and level two housing? It's, it's generally for the more intensive, Gina, that you get direct, and, and that has to be if you qualify for some of the clinical aspects. One of the things we are working on is a, a, kind of a a case rate, if you will, for individuals in recovery housing. We haven't seen that uh, model, but we've, we've got the model. We're working with a national group to do that, which would cut across all types of recovery housing. We think that'll probably require, and uh, I know Danielle in um, Ohio's work with the NAR affiliate, that'll probably care, require some sort of certification and some outcomes for individuals to qualify for that. And that's in the future. What you can do though for the lower levels is certainly make sure that your uh, members that can can qualify for Medicaid. Now that if they're employed and they're paying rent, they may not be able to qualify for that. If, if they um, even have some family members or some dependents that are not living with them in that facility, they may be able to, to get that. And what does that do? That, that doesn't directly put money into a pocket, but it certainly keeps that individual with health care support, family support, and makes them uh, it makes it easier for them to maintain their employment. The other thing I'd also like to talk about, it's not Medicaid, but I wanted to say is that even if an individual is not in one of these higher level that we talked about and they're working, there's always the, uh, the need to see if they can't improve um, their income basically and they may be able to get certification so don't think just because you're operating a small house and the folks are employed they may be in service jobs entry-level jobs and if you can facilitate them to to move up into some certificate and more meaningful employment you're really making a lot of difference on your sustainability as well great great information so at what point, Lori talked about the journey, you know, the different stages that someone who comes into treatment and then as they progress on, uh, at what point in the training and employment process will clients need to have access to housing that's outside the actually medical assistment, assisted treatment facility? So... Um, Gina, the way that the centers that we are currently working with, which is the Recovery Kentucky program, um, usually about, uh, they start looking about two to three months prior to them phasing out of the center. So when they, they, you know, when they move from phase one to phase two, which phase two is more of that education and employment phase, where we're prepping them to transition out. Um, they have to have a plan beginning at that phase as to where they're going and looking at housing and, and all those kinds of things. So if we're giving them skills and training, then we can link them to employers um, where they're going to transition out. Um, so some of them choose to stay in the, in the community that they're in already. Others want to go home or go to another location. So I would say at least, you know, two to three months prior to them phasing out, just from my experience with Recovery Kentucky. But of course, each center is going to have its own individual programming. Um, but, you know, I'm always willing to take a look at that with people um, and, and we can figure it out together. Okay. Another question about uh, thinking about the employer's role how does the support of the employer partners help in covering the cost of maintaining um, housing or providing housing for those in recovery, the support that they need? Um, again, like Ernie said, you know, I think at some phases um, or in some types of centers, depending on what type of recovery house you have, you know, individuals could be required um, to pay um, some sort of a, a rent or a weekly um, rate for staying there. So of course the employment's gonna help on that, that piece. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, as far as the employers themselves, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, if, if we have employers who are directly contributing, uh, you know, to a recovery house, but I think there's definitely opportunity and I think employers are seeing the benefits of hiring these individuals and that they are better workers and they are staying employed, which reduces their turnover rate tremendously, saving them money in the long run. So, you know, I don't think it's, it's uh, too far of a reach to think that there may be some employers who, who may want to even create some housing. I know App Harvest has been very creative in providing transportation to individuals. Um, you know, they um, realize that transportation can be a, bar a barrier in rural Kentucky. So they have actually offered to run routes themselves to pick people up. You know, I think if, if we can get employers to think along those lines, I think Toyota is doing the same. Um, you know, what are the, you know, have their HR department really focus on what are the barriers of all of their employees, um, but, you know, particularly those who have come from some harder places. Um, and how can we alleviate some of those barriers so we can, you know, assist them into, uh, try, you know, becoming a, a valued employee here. And so I think an employer, if they could think like that um, and have that relationship with those recovery houses, um, they would see that in the long run, um, you know, they're going to have better employees as well as, you know, save money on that turnover rate. Right. We have Michelle Skaggs on the recovery to work cohort team and she talked last day one for day one session about Belicio Foods and how they feel about their employees and that this is kind of the discussion you know the reason for the summit is how can we bring people along and I think Belicio Foods is a leader in the region on you know finding ways to support their workers they actually Michelle can talk more about this in the Q&A but they actually did come up with transportation so those are the kinds of uh, partners that we like to definitely join together here that uh, in our role, like how can we all come together on that? Um, another question I wanted to ask before we move on with Danielle is here. She can tell us probably more about those levels of housing and we'll learn more from her about the Ohio recovery housing. Um, the last question, if someone is interested in starting recovery housing, which we hope everyone on this summit is interested in that, can they reach out to you all for more assistance and does it cost anything? Um, good question, Gina. That's, you know, that's why we really appreciate the opportunity to share with you all is that um, the answer is yes. Uh, Fletchergroup.org, Fletchergroup.org. And there's a, a technical assistance request form on there, fill that out. And that's the easiest way. Um, and, the uh, you should somebody should reach out to you fairly quickly. It depends on a, a few factors. If you're you have to be serving a rural community that's designated for us to do that without you know free basically or it's it's grant funded. Um, if you're in an urban community and you're serving some rural counties, then that that qualifies you as well. But uh, FletcherGroup.org, reach out to us that way, and that's th that way we can get it to the right person. Erica in, in Ohio is your outreach engagement specialist. Erica, I don't know if you give your email or whatever you want. There is uh, uh, is a way of reaching us as well, Gina. Okay, I when I send follow up, I'll definitely include emails and website links for people to click on through. Uh, Stephanie Carpenter is joining us from Parkersburg, West Virginia, and she made the comment they are currently working in the same direction in Parkersburg, West Virginia area. And you know how much Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia, we love each other. We have a tri-state <laughs> alliance, you know, we're all connected. So good job, Stephanie. They work for the National Health Emergency Grant for Opioid Crisis in Parkersburg. And she just wanted you to know it's great information and they just had a participant open a new so sober living home. So, you know, people are moving in that direction. And also Ernie, you mentioned the uh, strategy to rehab homes. And I wanted to preview to everyone, Julie Bolin, who is the Ross County Community Action Commission Executive Director is gonna share their story. This is a local a story about recovery housing and that was their strategy. They worked with the city and she'll have more details on that, but just to get that housing at a really low cost and rehab that. So that's 
her story's coming up. And I mentioned Michelle Skaggs from Belicio Foods. She'll be on the Q&A panel as well. She's the Senior Manager of Human Resources person at Belicio Foods. She's got a lot of employer perspective to add. Jamie Colley will be on the uh, Q&A, counselor with Hope Source Treatment in Portsmouth, Ohio. He's a licensed social worker and he is boots on the ground. He is really working with that population and he can give their perspective. And Kim Reynolds, our development director here at OVRDC, will be on the Q&A. So I, I wanna thank you again, Ernie and Lori. And if you're able to stick around for that Q&A, we would love to have you um, for any questions that people have. And Stephanie, thank you for your comment. Drop your questions in the chat box and we'll definitely get to them. So I'm gonna move on next and say, good morning, Danielle Gray. How are you, Danielle? I'm doing great, thanks. We are really glad to connect with you as well. Uh, Danielle has worked in the health and human services field for over 10 years, specializing in the social determinants of health and developing programs and advocating for public policies to increase access to services and supports that positively impact your health outcomes. Danielle became the executive director of Ohio Recovery Housing, an alliance of recovery housing operators providing high quality recovery housing opportunities for people with substance use disorders in 2017. As executive director, Danielle Gray is responsible for assisting recovery housing operators in fully understanding and implementing national quality standards for recovery housing. Danielle received her master's in public health from The Ohio State University in 2009 and is certified in public health by the National Board of Public, public Health Examiners. So welcome Danielle Gray. Great to have you, Danielle. We're looking forward to learning more about recovery housing in Ohio. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, it's really exciting to be here. And I too am looking forward to the day when we can do this in person again. Um, so, but thank you all for joining this, this virtual session. Um, I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity um, to meet all of you. Uh, so first just to introduce, you know, o Ohio Recovery Housing. Um, Ohio Recovery Housing is the state affiliate of the National Alliance of Recovery Residences. And so one of the things that we are most well known for is our certification process. Um, as the NAR affiliate in Ohio, uh, we have created and maintained a review process that verifies standards of excellence in recovery housing. But in addition to this review process, we also do a lot of other work. Uh, we develop resources related to recovery housing. Um, we produce best practice guidance, including guidance on MAT and recovery housing, um, best practice guidance for addressing NIMBY concerns, and a whole plethora of best practice guidance on COVID-19 and recovery housing. Um, so we have that available for, uh, for operators of recovery housing. We also um, provide advice and information so people can call our office at any time and ask us questions and we can help them answer them, connect them to resources, um, connect them to other operators of recovery housing in Ohio so they can um, have peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities. And we also track resident outcomes. Um, so we look at data and we look at, you know, what outcomes are, are residents experiencing and we use that data um, for quality improvement as well as planning. And we also provide a lot of training opportunities. Um, I heard today people asking questions about wanting to start recovery housing. We have a specific training upcoming for that in April. Um, so you can you know, look at our website, contact our office, and we can get you connected to those sorts of training opportunities. So we also do work to educate and inform on recovery housing. You know, we show up at events like this and talk about recovery housing, what it is, and its important role in our communities. And so we really try to advocate for recovery housing as a critical piece of the continuum of care for people in recovery. And so today, I just want to give you a brief overview of what recovery housing looks like in Ohio, um, you know, what we typically see in Ohio and what our landscape is and what has been really successful so far in our state um, in what we've been doing as far as implementing recovery housing in Ohio. I want to give you a brief overview of some recent data that we have that's specific to Ohio, so you have that in your thoughts and planning. I want to address some emerging trends that we're seeing in our state, look at some public policy, and then also provide you with some resources that might be helpful as you think about how to integrate recovery housing in your communities. 
So to start us off, I want to make sure we're all on the same page when we talk about recovery housing. Um, I know we, we just talked about this at our last session a couple weeks ago, um, but I know some people may be joining us today who, who weren't on that last session. So recovery housing means housing for individuals recovering from alcoholism or drug addiction that provides an alcohol and drug-free living environment, peer support, assistance with obtaining alcohol and drug addiction services, and other alcoholism and drug addiction recovery assistance. Um, that is a definition from our Ohio Revised Code, and we're actually really lucky to have such a great solid definition in our Revised Code here in the state of Ohio that can really help us guide our work around implementing recovery housing. And so recovery housing is not just a place to stay. Um, you know, recovery homes do much more than just provide a, a roof over someone's head. Um, recovery homes follow all laws, so that means that they are aware and pay attention to their local building codes and zoning, and they are aware of landlord-tenant law, and they implement landlord-tenant law in their homes. Um, they also provide services and supports. They ensure that services like mutual aid and peer support are present within the home. Um, it's, recovery homes are places where re residents recovery is planned for. So they're meeting regularly with residents on what we call resident driven recovery plans that help residents identify their own goals and make progress towards those goals. They live together in the home as a family. So they develop relationships with one another. They care about one another and they support one another in their recovery and really live together as a family. Um, there's also really solid policies and procedures in place that are designed to help keep the home safe. Um, so policies and procedures that help monitor for any potential um, reoccurrence of symptoms of the disease of addiction and really well implemented policies on how to handle those to ensure the safety of all of the residents within the recovery home. So really recovery homes are this complete environment that's available to support people in their recovery. And so I know you saw this information a couple of weeks ago, but I do want to be clear about recovery housing in Ohio and specifically how you know, we have implemented a regulatory framework around recovery housing in Ohio. Um, I know this came up in our last session in particular. Um, so you notice on this chart, I have level four blocked off in red. And so if a recovery home or a place is offering clinical treatment services, on site in that building, we do not consider that recovery housing in the state of Ohio. That is considered residential treatment and it must be licensed by the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. So if you are offering, you know, clinical counseling, um, you know, you're, ha you're having group services or you're doing intensive outpatient treatment within the same building as the recovery home, um, we do not consider that recovery housing those clinical treatment services need to take place off site and be in a different location. And there needs to be a clear separation between your recovery housing program and any clinical treatment services that are being offered. Ohio does have a section 1115 waiver. And so if you are an organization that is considering that type of model where you are offering both clinical services as well as recovery housing services, I really encourage you to look at that waiver and to pay attention to the work of, of that waiver. You can contact our office. We serve as a, um, on the advisory committee for that waiver. And so I can provide you know, more detailed information about what's going on. But a big focus of that waiver is here in Ohio, us establishing this clear line of separation between clinical treatment services and recovery housing. And so um, I just, you know, want to bring that up because that's something, you know, like uh, Dr. Fletcher said, each state is unique and different. And this is a way that um, I feel Ohio really is um, being unique in their strategy of really trying to define, you know, what is housing, what is treatment, and making sure that the line between them is very clear. Um, so for us here in Ohio, what recovery housing is, is levels one, two, and three. You know, level four, that's residential treatment certainly a critical component of the continuum of care, something we certainly need to promote and make sure there's access to in all of our communities. But when we talk about recovery housing in Ohio, we're talking about levels one, two, and three, and level four is considered residential treatment and those clinical services really are something that is separate. 
And so, you know, one of the things that people wanted me to talk about today was how much recovered housing exists in Ohio. Like, what is our existing landscape? You know, what, how much of this level one, two, and three do we have? And we currently have 309 organizations or known organizations operating 615 known properties with a total capacity to serve just about 5,800 Ohioans at a time. And 260 of those properties are certified by Ohio Recovery Housing as meeting national quality standards. And this is our known universe. In Ohio, it is not a requirement for a recovery home to become certified or to be listed anywhere. Um, this is the best of our knowledge. And we actually today have, I believe, much greater knowledge um, of what exists because of the COVID-19 crisis and the work that we have been doing to try to ensure access to both PPE and vaccines um, for recovery homes within the state of Ohio. As I'm sure many of you know, recovery housing was included in phase 1A for the vaccine. So that process allowed us to really get a really good list of homes um, because with COVID and the vaccine, homes just really needed to, to get more connected than they ever had before. So it's still not a complete list, but I believe it's the most complete we're ever gonna get given our current circumstances. Um, so that is how much recovery housing that we know of that exists in the state. And so looking at the continuum, um, again, this is our only our certified properties because we don't have enough information about the non-certified properties to appropriately tell them what level of support they are. But among our certified properties, we have much more capacity in level support in level two and in level three and very little capacity in our level one level of support. Um, so we do know that level one is certainly a need in the state of Ohio. Um, it is certainly there's a need across the entire continuum. Um, there, you know, uh, we do need those highly supportive environments, you know, for people, especially people who are very early in recovery. Um, but certainly we are also seeing a need for people who need that continuous support. We know research says that people need to hit five years in recovery. Um, in order to see those significant declines in the likelihood of reoccurrence of symptoms. And so that level one, level two su level of support really also is needed. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, again, in Ohio or across our continuum, we have a lot more capacity in level, in level three and level two than we do in level one. And looking specifically at the 12 county area that you, know, you all serve, um, we have a total capacity in this area of 584, so 584 people can be served. And there are three counties um, that have no capacity, so there are no re known recovery residences within those three counties. And so looking at the need, um, I pulled some data from the Ohio Department of Health, their drug overdose data. Um, this is from 2013 to 2018, the most recent data that we had available. But if you guys have been following the news, I'm sure you are not shocked to see from the Ohio Attorney General, they took a look at data, statewide data for drug overdose deaths and found really alarmingly high rates um, for the last quarter of 2020 um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the isolation economic hardship that that is causing. So um, this data is a little bit old, but we have every reason to believe that the crisis is just deepening due to the pandemic. Um, and I also put in bold here five counties that are in the top 10 ranks of drug overdose deaths across the state of Ohio. And I also include here um, a, you know, some data from the county health rankings from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on adult binge drinking. Uh, certainly the opioid crisis is something that has captured all of our attention. It's a deadly disease um, and we certainly must address it but it is a part of a larger addiction crisis. And certainly if alcohol sales are anything, um, to, um, any indicator of an increase in alcohol use disorder, we know we are seeing much higher sales of alcohol within the state of Ohio. And so we are thinking that that is certainly going to lead to an increase in alcohol use disorder. And so I pulled some data here on adult binge drinking um, just so we know we're trying to look at the whole picture and not just focus on one uh, particular condition. And so what does a typical recovery house look like in Ohio? And I just have a photo here. Of, this is one of our recovery homes that we have certified. They gave me permission to put the photo of the home here. And you know, it's just a, a standard, typical single family home. Um, you would drive down the street 
and not even know that this was a recovery residence. Um, you would see the residents living in there and you wouldn't know unless somebody told you that they were um, people in recovery living together as a family. And that is typical of what we see in our state. 85% uh, of the recovery homes that we know about in Ohio have a capacity less than 12. Um, so they're certainly smaller homes. They're in single family neighborhoods. Um, so right there, you know, with parks and everything like any other um, family. We have slightly more homes that serve men than serve women. The majority of our homes are not certified. So we might not know as many details about them and their programming. And again, we have mostly level two and level three recovery homes. And these are photos from the inside of that recovery home that I showed you earlier. So most of our homes are just again, typical single family homes. Uh, residents have a bedroom, um, they eat in the dining room, they have a typical kitchen, you know, if they want to have a bowl of cereal at 2 a.m., they can go make themselves a bowl of cereal at 2 a.m., just like any other person living in a home. Um, they have free use of space. It really is just a very homey, home-like environment, and that is really something that has been promoted by um, by our Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services is really focusing in on making sure that these homes are integrated in the community um, and that they are as home-like as possible for people in recovery. So taking a look at our data, um, Ohio Recovery Housing has been implementing a survey for the past five years. So we have five years of data that we've collected from across the state of Ohio, from across a variety of levels of support and different organizations. Um, we have collected data from over 147 uh, recovery housing properties so far, and residents complete this survey when they move in at six months and when they move out. And we have performed a detailed analysis of this data up to November of 2020. And so if you're interested in really diving deeper into that, we have a report available on our website. Of course, I have to talk about limitations. This is really very valuable data, but I do want to make sure that we're careful as we look at the data, you know, as we would be anytime we're looking at a data set. Um, so some of our limitations are that survey participation is voluntary, residents can skip any question that they want, um, organizations aren't required to participate in this survey, they do it because they want the data, um, and again, a resident can refuse to complete the survey. And then as I described earlier, not much know, is known about the complete universe of recovery residences in the state. So it's really hard for us to say like, yes, our sample of surveys that we have gotten is a representative sample of all recovery homes. Um, so we still think the data is, is valuable for us to, to learn something, but we wanna make sure that we're clear about some of our limitations. And one of the most important things that we learned here, um, again, going back a little bit to that previous chart I had, we know that um, the opiate crisis is real. We do see 69% of our survey respondents are in recovery from an opiate use disorder. But also we had 57% of people in our recovery homes who are reporting that they are in recovery from alcohol use disorder. So we know that this is a larger addiction crisis and we really are trying to focus in not only on opiates, but also looking at you know, all substances and really looking at a whole person instead of just a particular substance. And when we look at resident income, we are seeing that 48% um, of residents when they move into recovery housing have no income and 20, only 23% of residents when they move out have no income. So we are seeing residents you know, gain income, and mostly that's through employment. So when we have residents move in, 57% of that cohort um, do not are not working, and they're not looking for paid work. Um, and when we look at people who move out, um, we have 52% who are working part-time or full-time, 14% who are actively engaged in trying to find paid work, and only 33% um, who are not you know, looking for paid work. We also see really successful outcomes when we ask people where they're going when they move out of recovery housing. A vast majority of people are moving on to a residence that's owned or rented by them. So they're moving on into their own place, their own stable environment, or they're moving in with family or friends. So that's really a successful outcome for us. Um, people are not returning to incarceration. They're not returning to treatment. They're you know, moving on into more stable environments. And so that's a really good outcome for us statewide. 
We also see increases in um, positive in self-reported um, mental health and physical health. We just ask people, um, you, or how is your mental health on most days? Is it good? Is it fair? Is it poor? And so we see um, that there are increases in you know, our cohorts of more people reporting that their mental health or physical health was good on most days you know, at move out than at move in. And we also see increases in participation in recovery support activities. This is our indicator that even after people move out, are they gonna continue to be successful? We know that continued engagement in these ongoing activities is an indicator of future success even after they move out. And so we certainly see that people are getting more engaged in the larger recovery community as they live in recovery housing. And that's certainly a positive sign that people are gonna to continue to be successful. When we looked at the data, we also looked at any future needs that we might have. And so I just wanna highlight some of the other things we found in the data as far as future needs. Um, we certainly need more family support and support for families. 64% of our residents identified as being a parent and 47% of residents identify as being a parent of a child or children under the age of 18. And so looking at some of our data with regards to custody status of those minor children, um, we certainly see that by far the most popular response is that the child is in the custody of their other parent or their family member. Um, but we do see that when comparing cohorts, asking them about if the child is in their custody and resides with them, you know, it's about 6% you know, of our moving cohort, but 11% of our move out cohort. So we do see that those anecdotal stories we hear about people reuniting with their family and with their children you know, are real and that is great. But we aren't really seeing a lot of movement in when we ask people about is if their child is in custody of child welfare. And of course that makes sense. Those issues take long, a long time to resolve and for people to work through. And so um, it's not surprising that somebody who might be staying in a recovery home for a year, 18 months, may not be able to resolve those issues. But that certainly makes us you know, understand that, hey, these are ongoing supports that this person is going to need to focus on, and we need more resources to help them focus on that. Similarly, um, long-term support for people who are involved in the criminal justice system. We have seven to 11% of our residents are involved in drug court and 40 to 43% are on parole or probation. And we know that again, these are issues that take years for people to, um, to work on, to deal with and to overcome. And so we know that we need more support for residents who are involved in these types of programs, helping them make sure that they can be successful. We know that a criminal justice history can prevent you from getting a job or can prevent you from even, for, from even renting an apartment. Um, so we really want to make sure that there's more supports available to assist this particular population. And then particularly for, um, for this group, because you all are very rural counties, transportation is a huge issue. Um, we saw that only 47% of residents who are moving out of recovery housing have their driver's license. That is a higher number than residents that moved in. So we are certainly seeing that people are getting their driver's license back as a part of their recovery housing program but 47% is still a really low number. There are a lot of barriers and challenges to helping people get their driver's license back. And I'm sure I don't have to go into too much detail. You all know this, um, but certainly in our rural areas, there's more barriers for public transit and for transportation. And so that lack of a driver's license for a resident can really be a barrier for them getting a job, getting education, getting all the social services and supports that they need. Um, so we really need to address some of these barriers to really help people get their driver's license back or to get them access to reliable transportation so that way they can get a job, you know, get connected in their community um, and really remove that barrier to success for them. And we also see an increased need for financial wellness. 95% uh, of residents in recovery housing have some sort of debt and 19% of residents have debts that are in the amounts of over $10,000. We know from research that it can take a lifetime for people to pay off debt, and it can take many years to even pay off small amount, relatively small amounts of debt, especially if someone is low income. And so the, these debts can really be a barrier to someone. And also poor credit history can also be a barrier to employment or a barrier to um, somebody getting their own apartment, renting their own apartment, or getting a loan for their, for their own home. 
And so we, we do need more information and help for financial wellness. Also something that we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic was that it was wonderful that a lot of residents of recovery housing were able to get um, back unemployment or they were able to get um, stimulus checks. But sometimes getting all that unplanned and unexpected income can be a trigger for people in their recovery. And so we need more resources on how to help residents have those conversations and think about financial planning um, and integrating all that financial wellness into their recovery journey. So really helping people figure out like, how do we use my, my money and my financial wellness to further promote my recovery goals? Um, and so we've seen a lot of operators do that really, really well. And so we want to uplift those best practices and bring those out to everyone. So that way, again, as we're looking at a potential another round of stimulus checks or you know, unemployment compensation, that we're prepared and we don't see residents um, have a reoccurrence of symptoms because they have additional money that might be a trigger. And so just quickly looking at some future landscape. Um, there is uh, CARA 2.0. Our very own Senator Portman from the state of Ohio is introducing this legislation. Um, it would have $765 million in resources for recovery programs, including recovery housing. This legislation also includes the text of the Excellence in Recovery Housing Act, which would support states to implement quality standards, conduct research, and create a federal work group headed by HUD and SAMHSA to address recovery housing issues and also expand access to federal housing for people of misused substances or had a criminal conviction. Um, there's also new leadership at HUD and SAMHSA. Um, Marsha Fudge from Ohio has been nominated as HUD secretary. And so she would be, if that if CAR 2.0 passed with the Excellence of Recovery Housing Act, um, she would be leading you know, that effort along with um, SAMHSA to uh, have that work group. We also have seen some federal resources come to Ohio for COVID relief, including the Home Relief Grant Program. And this is something that residents of recovery housing, if they're behind on their rent, they can apply to a community action agency to have their rent paid. Um, so this is a one example of how we think broadly about recovery housing here in Ohio, and it is a housing program. And so recovery homes and residents of recovery homes were eligible to have their residents apply for this program and get relief. And there's been additional dollars added to that program from the last um, relief package in December, and we anticipate even more relief coming. We also have seen federal increases in block grant funding. Um, so these are the substance abuse prevention and treatment block grants. There's a 60 million increase and these can be used to invest in recovery housing. And also our governor in the executive budget for the um, Ohio, Ohio's general revenue funds has proposed a 20% um, boost in the recovery housing line item in the state of Ohio. So that are, those are additional resources going towards recovery housing for the state of Ohio. And so I know some of you had questions about like, hey, do you want to start a recovery house? Um, there are a lot of great resources. So we have a free training coming up on April 27th at 4 p.m. You can sign up for that. It's virtual like everything is these days. Um, so please do sign up for that. We've got a couple. We always have a recovery housing operator who shares their story and how they got started. And we really feel like We've gotten great feedback from folks about, you know, saying like, oh, hearing that story and learning from them how they did it really helped. And then they stick around and they answer questions and um, and help um, you know help people from that perspective of an operator. And then we're also there as a high recovery housing um, to let you know about funding that's particular for Ohio and Ohio specific um, regulations and requirements. There's also the Recovery Housing Development Guidebook that's available. Um, that was produced by us in the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services that really goes through all the things you need to think about um, if you're gonna be considering starting a recovery home. And then of course you can contact us. And then finally, if you wanna start collecting outcomes, I know um, Dr. Fletcher talked about um, the importance of collecting outcomes. We have a free tool that you can use um, and so I'm just gonna show my screen here. Um, this is what we provide for free to operators who want to participate in our survey program. So you would have your residents fill out a survey, move in six months, move out, and then you would get access to this data dashboard that updates, I believe every 15 minutes. 
So you have real time access to your data and it would produce all of these helpful charts and graphs for you. So that way you can take this data to your community meetings, um, to your um, grant funders, potential funders and show them your exact outcomes and your ability to track you know, resident data. And so this is a really great tool and we know uh, operators in Ohio have used it you know, for that fundraising purpose. And so if you're interested in starting to collect this data, we all, we ju you just have to attend a free training so we can get you set up and you can learn how to use it. And we offer those free trainings once a month. Um, so I certainly, um, if you're interested in that, please sign up for that training or contact our office. We would love to help you start collecting data and give you access to those tools. And then here's my contact information. So if you do have other questions, um, you want more advice or more support, you know, this is my email, this is my phone number, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, that is what we are here for, is to help operators in Ohio. And I know I saw someone from Parkersburg, West Virginia. Um, if you, you can email me and I can put you in touch with Emily. Um, she uh, runs our sister agency, Wavar, down in West Virginia. Um, and so we, you know, I can get you connected to whatever other state affiliate leader if you're not from Ohio as well. Danielle, thank you so much. Wow, lots of great stuff. And I'm hoping we can share your slides with everyone after I can send it out. Okay, great. So many tools. I didn't know about the data tracking. That's wonderful. And I will definitely also try to, let's get everyone signed up for your training that's coming up because I think that would be really great information as well. Um, Danielle's going to take a drink and we're going to roll into questions. And I have one for you, Danielle, a couple in the chat box. Level two housing seems to have more available housing and it might help to understand how many people transition to level two each year. So how does Ohio track the vacancy rates in recovery homes and how do people transition from one level to the next? Yeah, um, we do have several operators who offer multiple levels of support. And so they might offer a level three and then if somebody, and then they have like a phase approach. So when that person reaches a certain point where they're ready to live in a level two environment, they don't need the 24 seven staff support anymore. You know, they move into a level two environment. And then a lot of our level ones, you know, they're typically called graduate homes. Like, you know, it's somebody who still wants to live with other people in recovery. They still need a little bit of support but they can manage that environment themselves. And so they would live in a level one. And what we typically see people entering recovery housing um, in our level twos, they're typically coming from a residential treatment environment where they've had um, at least 30 days or around four weeks of recovery. So again, they've got a little bit of stability in their recovery and they're ready to live in an environment that doesn't need to be staffed 24 seven they're ready to start looking for a job um, and they're ready to, to really take ownership of their recovery plans and um, implement their recovery plans. We also see a, a lot of people moving into level two environments um, who are returning to the community after incarceration. Um, so they may again have a little bit of time in recovery and they're um, you know, again interested in getting into the community, getting a job, you know, really working on their recovery plan. So those are the two biggest places where people are coming from um, into our level two environments. Uh, people in level three, they're um, typically a little bit earlier in their recovery and they might be getting treatment services um, offsite. So it could be from the same organization offering the recovery housing or from a partner treatment organization, but they're really focusing in on completing their treatment program and they're you know, living in the recovery home and getting recovery support services you know, while they're in the recovery home. Um, so, so that's typically you know, what we see across those levels. Um, why do you think there's such a smaller amount of level one housing? I noticed that your graph data was really kind of a surprise. There's not much out there. Yeah, and um, that again could be that there's more out there. We just don't know about it. But you know, typically level ones, they're, they're self-sustaining. Um, the residents you know, come together, they, they pay the rent, you know, they share expenses, um, you know, and it's democratically run. 
So they might not be the ones to sign up and be like, hey, I want to be on a list. You know, I want to be certified. Um, so there could be more out there. Um, but I really think that, um, especially with our transition to where our treatment stays are shorter, um, there's more of a focus on giving people um, intensive outpatient services, that there's more of a need for these more structured environments for folks. And that really is the growing need, is that somebody is early in their recovery and they need a place to stay where there's that 24 seven staff support, um, you know, where there really is somebody who can meet with them frequently about their recovery plan, um, you know, they, or they need a monitored environment where they're surrounded by other people and they're not ready yet to, to live in that environment where there's no monitoring. And it's up to them to not only monitor their own recovery, but also support other people. So I think that there's just, you know, all the transitions in our environment have really led to this increased demand for those more structured environments. Um, another question about certification or around that, is there a square footage requirement for recovery housing? Um, not for the total home. What we look at as far as capacity is the bedrooms. So in Ohio, you have to have 70 square feet for the first person in the sleeping room and then 50 additional square feet for an additional person. So that's 70 square feet for one person, 120 square feet um, for two people, 170 square feet for three people, so on and so forth. And then you have to have enough storage space and things um, for, for those sleeping rooms. And there must be one full bathroom, so one toilet sink shower for every six people. Um, so if you've got one full bathroom and you, even though your bedrooms are huge um, and you can fit seven in the bedrooms, you are gonna have to add another bathroom in order to have additional people. Um, we also, again, it's their home. They're gonna be using the space. You're gonna have house meetings. So you gotta have your common space big enough to hold those meetings. Um, and a kitchen dining area big enough for people to share a meal together. So again, you can have huge bedrooms and be like, oh, I can fit eight people in the bedrooms. But if you only have enough room for five people to eat dinner in the kitchen, um, you might want to restructure or rethink that or make some improvements to the home to make that possible. Um, so yeah, and we have all that spelled out in the development guidebook, or you can call me about if you have questions about your particular property, and I'd be happy to answer them. We have Fast and Furious on questions now. Can you open a faith-based home? Yes, yes, we have um, several faith-based homes. Actually, Reba McCray, the president of our board of directors, she operates a faith-based recovery housing program. So yes, uh, faith-based programs are, you know, are certainly something that we see a lot of and we have a lot of them certified. Last question, Danielle, before we move into the panel of Q&A, is there an opportunity for county land banks to play a role in recovery housing and are you aware of any such efforts? Yes, I, I do know of several operators who have partnered with land banks um, for, you know, for funding in order to establish recovery housing. Um, and so that, that there's certainly a role there um, for creating that partnership in order for you know, recovery homes to secure appropriate properties and um, establish recovery housing. So yes, certainly land banks can, can be huge players um, in developing the recovery support in communities. Danielle, thank you so much for your information and for being with us today. All right, um, I wanna just introduce everyone to our panel and a couple of questions for them to start our discussion, but thank you so much for the chat questions and thank you to everyone so far for all the great information. We're gonna share that out later after this as well as the recording. Uh, speaking of land banks, I'm going to turn it over first to Julie Boland to talk a little bit about their actual housing project they have in Ross County. And then uh, also Michelle Skaggs from Belicio Foods had questions from day one session that we want to follow up with her. So either one can go first, Jamie, or I'm sorry, Michelle or Julie, whoever wants to go first in our panelist Q&A and everyone just drop the questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to them. Okay. I, good morning, everyone. I can start. Um, so I'm Julie Bolin. I'm the executive director of Ross County Community Action. I'm also um, on the core team for the Recovery to Work 
uh, learning cohort. So um, I just wanted to briefly talk about um, some of the things that we're doing in our organization um, for recovery housing. About a year ago, um, we secured some funding from the finance fund and our Adam H board. And um, we were able to purchase a home here in Chillicothe in Ross County. And we have been working now for the last nine months to rehab that property. And um, we are close to having it complete. And our um, development director, Teresa Yinger, has been participating in the Recovery Ohio Recovery Housing Institute. So she has been um, learning a lot and we are preparing for certification um, for our recovery home. Um, so we have not actually had anyone move in yet or we're not at that point in the project, but we're definitely still in the development stages. We were also um, just last week um, closed on a property that we purchased from our Ross County Land Bank, and we are starting the, the rehab work on that property. We have partnered um, with both of these projects and will continue to partner with Alvis House which is a re-entry program and they are coming on site and um, doing community service hours for us. And we are also partnering with Pickway Ross Career and Technology Center and their adult workforce skilled trades training program. So they're gonna be using this new house that we're starting to work on as a, a house project for their electrical HVAC carpentry adult um, training program. So, um, you know, it's definitely um, a, a great community project. Um, we're also partnering with our local health district on a COSAP grant that had just been awarded. And we're going to, through that funding, be able to hire a recovery housing coordinator. Um, we also partner with Adena Health Systems on their HRSA R-Corp grant. And recovery housing is one of the strategies in that grant. Um, we also have peer support specialists um, on staff now through that program that will be part of our recovery homes. We operate the CARES Recovery Support Program. Um, and you know that program provides a lot of wraparound care coordination, um, helping individuals transition into employment. Um, and we're able to help with getting driver's license reinstated and paying down fines, um, helping um, transition to that work um, piece as well. So um, that's, like I said, it's definitely a work in progress, but I wanted to have the opportunity to share um, on a local level, um, something that we're doing within the region and you know, look forward to continuing to develop these projects and um, continuing to work with such great community partners to make it happen. Thank you, Julie. Michelle, are you still on with us this morning? Michelle Skaggs from Belicio Foods. We had a few questions for you from the first day. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, Michelle, we're learning so much. And it's great to have you for that employer perspective. And thank you so much for what you shared on day one. Um, oh, some of the questions around employment in particular, one that was submitted we didn't get to was how do you handle privacy issues around helping an employee with substance use disorder or support services? Okay. Um, that's a good question. So our HR department um, is the only department privy to sensitive information with regards to an employee. Um, and as a matter of fact, if it's highly sensitive, which in my mind, this is highly sensitive um, with regards to confidentiality, then maybe only myself or, and one of my managers will know, right? We kind of narrow the scope of people because we want to be um, respectful. Um, so uh, now if the employee uh, shares, obviously that's out of our control, which does happen. As a matter of fact, it happened yesterday and, and you know, and um, someone came in and had some things that they were had to take care of. And, and I, Hey, are you, no, nope, I don't mind sharing. So, you know, it, it, it really depends, but uh, definitely we, we make sure that um, that is information that is very confidential. Yeah. And Michelle, you've been part of the Recovery to Work ecosystem, building that ecosystem. You know, you have been participating with the group for over a year. Why do you feel like it's a priority for Belicio and you personally to be part of this effort? 
oh my gosh, just um, helping the community, right? We have to adapt to the needs of the community. Um, for example, we mentioned earlier talking about transportation, especially in rural areas. Um, I mentioned on day one, I believe that we, um, we identified needs um, and collaborated with the YMCA, bought the van, had it driven down from Minneapolis. I don't know if I mentioned that the first time. And, and yeah, and, and so it's about, you know, those roadblocks, those roadblocks that prevent people from, um, you know, coming into the workforce. It's just really important. We believe, I said it last time, we believe in recovery. We believe in, in giving people opportunities. Um, we do go, I have um, one of my employees goes to the weekly drug court and, um, you know, and is involved in that. And, and uh, we work with the probation officers. And um, so, yeah, it's just our commitment to give back to the community. Thanks, Michelle, very much. Anybody have questions for Michelle? Drop them in if you want. Um, I wanted to also kind of visit with Jamie Colley, who was part of the core team, and get a little bit of perspective, Jamie, from you on all the things we've learned about recovery housing. Well, I, you know, there's a there's a lot of ideas, and I think this is helping it uh, narrow down to some, you know, pinpoint areas for a region and. You know, I think it's getting us in a position where we can start focusing on, you know, that gap that we're seeing between people getting the treatment they need and and uh, getting stabilized in the community. So uh, I think the focus is going in the right direction. Uh, all the panelists and all of the people who spoke seem to be sharing some of the same, you know, focus on um what do we do next? You know, what do we do next? We treat the people and then, you know, then what do we do, you know, to get them restabilized in the community? So um, I, I appreciate everyone's feedback. Jamie, one question more about from your perspective, what, what makes a successful long-term recovery? Because that's kind of where we're at when we're talking about recovery housing and re recovery to work support, you know, that's what we want to build is long-term recovery. What, what are the important components of that? Well, I think, you know, the beginning obviously is treatment. Like most people need some level of treatment in the beginning and, and uh, you see the most um, success when people get really involved in their local recovery community and really like focus most of their attention on, on that in the beginning. But the, the, I think the people who have the long-term success are, you know, given opportunities and mentored by other people and, and made a part of the community as a whole. And, uh, and they build that social capital in their life that most people in addiction lost, you know. So I believe that, you know, the, the sticking around and becoming more of a part of the community is, uh, you know, good signs of successful recovery. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, John Keery is with us. I see John over in the chat. Um, John is the director of the governor's office of Appalachia, and he was a, one of our speakers on day one. He has a great question for our panelists. And John, thank you again for joining us and for all your support in our region for what we're talking about, community engagement and workforce issues. His question to any of the panelists that want to jump in for sharing their ideas or their programs they have in place, how are transportation issues addressed for those in recovery to go to work and receive services? That's the question we saw from Danielle's slide. 47% have a driver's license when they leave recovery housing. So there are not a lot of people out there with SUD that have their driver's license. How can we help with transportation who would like to weigh in on this? I, I have one uh, outlook is like trying to focus, like be, be preemptive with where I'm uh, looking at developing the recovery housing in the first place, you know, and trying to find a space that um, is, is closer to the, available options and you know it seems that if we get 
a lot of recovery houses built really far away from any employment or services available, which is really easy to do in Ohio and Southern Ohio. And um, it's really easy to find these places that are just really far away from anything. And it seems to hinder the, a lot of progress there. So it's, you know, focusing being preemptive on location would be one thing. I would also just encourage folks to, to learn about resources that are in your community. Um, so I know Gina had mentioned at the start of this that their organization does the transportation planning um, for the area. So certainly learn about that process, learn about what they're doing, you know, what's going on with that planning, you know, bring your voice to that planning and let them know about the needs of the people that you're serving. Um, you know, uh, because certainly more resources are, are needed, especially in our rural areas, um, even in a lot of our cities. Like even, you know, we, we think that, oh, it's a city, it's got great public transit. Um, that might not even be the case um, when it comes to like getting people actually where they need to go on time in order to get to work every day. So it, it's a huge barrier um, for folks. Um, so I would certainly, you know, connect to like Gina's organization and learn about all they're doing around transportation. Cause I know that, you know, they, that they, they're, if they're doing the planning, they've got a lot of knowledge and expertise and um, could probably really use your voice to inform them. I know we just wrapped up a public uh, public information data collection surveys on a transportation plan for Scioto County and we reached out to our treatment pro providers down there to get their point of view and that's a great point Danielle you know we we all are working together I think that has been one of the themes of the day one and day two partnerships reach out you know let's talk let's come together let's all share ideas let's see what works what doesn't and Data is another theme that we've heard a lot about. Let's collect the data so we can prove our outcomes and analyze it and move resources quickly to address where we have shortages. It's, it's a really exciting um, time, I think, for Ohio and absolutely Kentucky. And thank you for sharing what you guys have. Erica, if you're still on, what kind of transportation issues and solutions have you found quickly before we wrap up. Well, something I was thinking of when you all mentioned that there are grants and, and loans also sometimes to get um, transportation for the recovery houses. Um, so I know USDA has a program where they've helped a lot of our programs get vans for transportation um, because most of our programs are in rural areas. So that was a way we were able to kind of address some of those transportation issues. Great. I can't say again, thank you so much everyone for joining us and just to wrap us up here at the end, we're going to go to the core team leaders for the Ohio Valley Recovery to Work cohort, Julie Bolin and my co colleague Kim Reynolds here, the development director for OVRDC. So thanks again for joining us. I'll send out everything later and Julie and Kim will take us home. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't doing me. I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and start. Um, so anyway, on behalf of the recovery to work learn, learning cohort and the core team here, I just want to thank everyone for um, participating in these uh, two days um, summit. Our, we have had such wonderful um, presenters and panelists, and um, it's great to see the regional representation of those participating in the summits and listening in today. Um, when we started, we came together a year ago, and um, we through our core team um, and several other um, team members that represent organizations throughout our region. Um, we learned a lot about best practices and great things that are going on um, with recovery to work initiatives and recovery support programs. Um, but we were able to also identify the gaps and recovery housing kept coming up um, within our region is definitely a gap in our recovery support systems when we're looking at recovery to work and so the, the purpose of the summit was to, to bring together resources and information and more best practices and just to start the conversations and spark the inspiration to, um, you know, what can we do to develop more recovery housing? And as you can hear 
from all these panelists and um, presenters that it's not one person that's going to do it. It's not one entity, one organization. We have to work together. We have to partner together. And that's definitely what this cohort has been about over the last year. So I really just appreciate the opportunity to be part of this. And I thank OBRDC for taking the initiative to convening this group and moving it forward over the last year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kim. Thank you. Um, this is kind of repetitive, but I just want to go back to what John said. OVRDC, when we decided to do this, we were no ex we had no expertise at SUD or recovery, and it's been a great learning experience for me. Um, but one of the reasons we did it is because we knew that our 12 counties had robust ideas, and we wanted to bring that together. And as we've talked about, it's the partnerships. And I think that this just emphasizes the um, need for us to work together and for each of you to just keep sharing your ideas. And I want to thank you all for your um, participation. And feel free to reach out to us at any time if you have questions. If we don't know the answer, we, we have that hub of inter information that we can try to get the information to you. So feel free to reach out to us. Absolutely. Thank you again for joining us, everyone. Go have a great day and I'll send you all the information in your, in your email inbox. So thanks again. See you next time. Bye. Bye.